is turn it up, you like chance and whiz. Chance is out and take. And take you up on a day like this. These days I always miss. And then I write about them anyway. But what if, what if I told you I was brave? Would it make you want to stay? Baby, say, cause I can't stand the thought of losing you would be my biggest mistake. And I gave up, and yes, play by your rules, clean up your mess. Your cause mess. I stand beside you, ratify, you got no opinions. What if I settled just because I thought that I was second best? And oh, what the hell do you think this is? Ha. Singing, no, oh, oh. back for audio hour week four and today we are talking about equalization uh, this is arguably the most important tool well definitely the most important tool you have at your disposal as a mix engineer uh, if you had to tackle a project with no other kind of processing this is this is the only thing that you couldn't do without um, so first, let's just, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, let's just quickly explain what an EQ does. Uh, an EQ is a processor which, uh, by way of specific circuitry, allows the user to tailor the frequency content of a specific sound source. And we're, uh, we're going to get into what that specifically means as we go here. But uh, effectively, it allows you to, to an extent, change the tone of something, uh, but more accurately, uh, change how something fits with other sound sources. And that's really, uh, as far as I'm concerned, that's the definition of mixing, uh, making, making multiple sound sources fit together uh, so that nothing is overlapping, nothing is masking another sound, everything is audible, everything is clear and intelligible uh, without stepping on the toes of any other part. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and flip over to Pro Tools. Um, for today's examples, I've just got uh, 
this session that I'm working on. It's I've kind of hacked apart, and you'll see why as we as we go. But uh, here we have a a session for uh, a rock group. You've got drum set, bass, guitars, and some vocals. You're not going to hear the vocals though, because this hasn't been released yet. So you're going to have to wait on that and just live with the instrumental for now. Uh, but here's where I'm going to be doing uh, our demonstrations of what an EQ is, how to use it, and uh, the effects of it. So first of all, there are two primary types of equalizers. Um, and I'll show you an example of each. So the first type, the most simple type, is what's called a graphic equalizer. And those look something like this. Um, graphic equalizers, as you can see, they mark uh, certain frequency points that are not changeable and you are able to either raise or lower the amount of gain at each of these frequency points. Um, and each one of these has a, uh, a specific width, which we'll talk about as we go. Um, the graphic EQs are not commonly used in mixing. Uh, the most common use of a graphic EQ is using um, a bigger version of this that has 31 bands, uh, which is to say 31 set frequency points, um, uh, which are commonly used when you're working uh, on a live performance. Uh, they're used to do what's called tuning your PA speakers, meaning if the speakers themselves or the room that the speakers are in has a tendency to raise or cut specific frequencies, you can compensate for that using your graphic EQ so that when you're mixing your sound sources, you kind of have like a neutral point to work from. Uh, so that's a graphic EQ. The much more common and much more useful type is a parametric EQ. And that looks like this. Um, so if any of you remember uh, parametric equations from your calculus classes, um, parametric EQs have three so-called parameters that uh, it allows you to affect the sound with. Um, you have a frequency that is variable. So like if I want to take this band here, this orange peak bell here, um, I can change what frequency this affects. I have full control of that. I have full control of an addition or a subtraction. And you also have control of width or Q range. Um, the amount of frequencies around the center frequency that you set that are affected and how gradually or extreme the effect is applied. Uh, as you can see, these are an extremely effective tool uh, as far as shaping sounds of individual sources and controlling the way those sources will be combined uh, with other sources. Um, but before we go any further um, with this demonstration of how EQs are used, I think it's probably worth backtracking a little bit and explaining the frequency spectrum itself. So if you remember from our previous episodes, um, we said that the uh, audible frequency spectrum, the the range that humans are able to hear extends from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Uh, so if you look at this, this graph here, this lower left corner on the x-axis is 20 hertz, and this far right corner is 20,000 hertz. 
So everything in between here is the audible frequency spectrum. Um, every sound source has content in some degree at every point along this chart. Uh, what does that mean? So typically we think of instruments as having specific ranges, like a bass is a lower ranged instrument than a violin. Um, but that is not to say that the bass doesn't have any upper frequency content. And that's not to say that the violin doesn't have any lower frequency content. Every sound source, regardless of what it is and where it's fundamental is, uh, which is to say the frequency of the first note that you hear, uh, regardless of where that sits, every sound source is going to have information at 20 hertz and at 20,000 hertz and everywhere in between. Now, obviously, from one source to another, it's going to be, it will have different tendencies, like it might have more, more low end, like obviously a bass is going to have much higher frequency content in the low end compared to the violin, uh, and vice versa, the violin's going to have much more high frequency content than the bass. Um, it is still present everywhere. Let me kind of, let me show you what I mean. Uh, so if I go to So if I go to my bass guitar uh, and I just hit play, this is dry, no processing. Okay, so again, we have this actually, this, this particular graph goes lower than the audible spectrum. It goes all the way down to eight hertz. But you can see this peak here is the so-called fundamental of the bass notes, uh, the actual starting frequency of each note. But there is content below it, and there's content all the way up into the upper register. So where you really get into mixing is asking yourself, okay, of this frequency spectrum of the bass, how much of that do I want it to contribute to my overall? Um, and for me, when I think about EQing across the board, um, for all of my sound sources, I want my end product, like if I put a graph like this across the master bus, like the summation of all of my sound sources, the end product, I want to be a generally flat line across the frequency spectrum. I want the low end and the high end to be represented in equal measure across the spectrum. So with that understanding, that's how you start thinking about, okay, what frequency content do I need this instrument to contribute? And what frequency content do I need to get rid of from this instrument so I can fill that hole with some other source? Like with a bass, this example, uh, all of the energy pretty much below 
100 hertz is going to be contributed by the bass and the kick drum. And then everything above that, not as much from the bass and the kick drum because that's where we need to leave space for the rest of our drum kit and all the guitars and the vocals. Um, which kind of leads me to my next point, which is, okay, if I'm hearing a fundamental frequency, but you're saying that each instrument, regardless of its fundamental frequency and its range, has the full frequency spectrum within it, how am I supposed to identify what that contribution needs to be how am I supposed to address any potential issues? Uh, and the answer is, uh, as, as potentially not fun as it may be, the answer is uh, through ear training. So uh, this is just a frequency generator that's going to illustrate this point. Um, if I play this sound back... Okay, so that, that pitch is a pure tone of 50 hertz, meaning that wave cycles 50 times every second. That is a fairly low pitch, and depending on your monitoring environment, you may or may not be able to hear this. Um, that exists both as a fundamental and as a harmonic, meaning just an artifact within a sound, meaning it's not the fundamental, it's not the first thing you hear, but it's still there. Whether it's there enough in a source to be audible or not is another matter. Uh, but if we were to follow this up, the frequency spectrum, uh, we might be able to kind of get a sense of of the relevance of the statement that each sound source has the full spectrum within it. So if you're listening to this pitch and thinking, okay, what are the characteristics of it? Well, it's, it's really low. It's kind of warm, um, kind of thick, feels supportive. Uh, those are characteristics that you would want in your low-end instruments like your bass and your kick drum. Those aren't really characteristics that you would want in your guitars or in your lead vocals. So for that reason, you would be more likely to keep or boost 50 hertz in your kick and your bass, and you would most likely cut 50 hertz out of any other sound sources. Um, now, if we jump up one octave from this, and an octave is just to say that you've doubled the frequency. So if we jump up an octave from 50 to 100, there's 100 hertz. Uh, kind of similar to 50 hertz uh, in that it's still pretty low. Still kind of has a warmth to it, but you notice that it starts getting kind of boomy kind of unnatural sounding. Um, so this is a frequency that has a tendency to stack up in a lot of instruments. Um, and we'll get into later about how to address that. But uh, again, this is, this is a frequency that you're going to want to address, or a frequency range. I'm just using uh, the G octave scale for the sake of math because it happens to be uh, even intervals all the way up. But, you know, wherever these trouble frequencies arise, they're always going to be within a certain range. Um, so you notice here some boominess starts to creep in. If we go up another octave to 200. Okay. So now we're starting to get kind of into what we would call the mid-range. Um, this is still kind of having that, that boomy kind of unpleasant, strange, ear-catching quality to it. Um, and the, the frequencies around this, like, like the range, would have those characteristics as well. 
Um, but you could you can see how this would start to stack up and get unpleasant if it was present in every sound source. But if it was taken out of most sound sources and added tastefully back to others, this could provide um, a sort of support. Uh, it's kind of like a a basis for uh, an upper, like a higher register sound. Uh, you'll have to excuse my my stammering a little bit. This is this is where you kind of start to get esoteric with the terms that you have available to describe uh, these sounds. And hopefully, this will make a little bit more sense as we go. We go up another octave to 400 hertz. So that's kind of you know piercing. Uh, but understand that I'm just going to turn that off so we don't have to listen to that this whole time. Understand that as you're getting above 200 hertz, doesn't matter what register the instrument is uh, or what you want its contribution to be, every sound source will have a fair amount of energy from 400 hertz and up to a certain point. But um, this is getting to pretty much be the smack dab middle of what we would consider to be our mid-range frequencies. And uh, as you'll see in the examples, those are the trickiest and most important frequencies to address because they are always so present in any sources. Now remember, every source is present at every point in the frequency spectrum, uh, but as you get to the extreme low and high ends of it, most of them start to taper off. Um, but the majority of sources at frequencies like 400 hertz and several of the ones higher um, tend to be kind of a plateau, if not be a boost there. A lot of fundamental frequencies in common ranges exist in in this hundred hundreds range of the frequency spectrum. If we go up another octave, here's 800. And the easy way uh, to remember this range, uh, your 800s to 1600s, is it's the sound of uh, the broadcast test. Like uh, when you first plug in an old TV, that's the sound you hear. Um, and that's the thing to keep in mind here as we're, as we're listening to these pitches um, and going up the scale, keeping in mind that these harmonics or harmonics within the range of these are going to be present in every sound. And that's what you're going to have to be listening for uh, in order to be able to identify contributions of parts and address them with your equalizer. Um, bear with me because that's, that takes, you know, years of practice, uh, and is very esoteric, especially when you are talking about like trying to hear a pitch like this, 1600 Hertz in a bass guitar. It's not going to sound like it's there. It is there. And in time, if you practice and learn how to identify it, you will eventually be able to hear it and address it accordingly. Um, but just having this understanding from the start uh, is worth having. So if this is 1600, so that's, um, you can hear how you're going to get like if, if a, an instrument has a lot of content at 1600, it's going to be very forward sounding. It's going to stick out. Uh, it's going to be like in your face. So sometimes that's what you want. Like if it's a guitar solo or a lead vocal, you may leave that frequency information in there or even boost it. Uh, if it's a background vocal, not so much. You know, if it's drum kit not so much uh 
continuing up, 3,200. So there's definitely no longer any fundamental frequency content in that. There's no instrument or voice that can produce a pure sound that high, but there is a lot of overtone harmonic content there. Uh, and again, it's, it's pretty, pretty grating. Uh, it's hard, uh, to manage this frequency range as well. Um, because it's still pretty present. A lot of the second order harmonics of sound sources are, uh, a lot of sound sources have their second order harmonics in this range. So this is always something that has to be addressed. Um, we're only going to go one more because then it starts really getting annoying, but we get up to 6,400. Definitely, uh, something that has to be tamed if it's present. Uh, this range is where, uh, a phenomenon called sibilance existed, exists, uh, which is to say, uh, the predilection for S syllables to jump out, become harsh. Uh, so, but again, you can get a lot of, uh, presence and clarity and forwardness brightness out of this range as well so just understanding its tendencies and how to use it like a lead vocal might really benefit from having some 6400 hertz range ish information left in it or even boosted uh to make it rise above the rest of the uh, sound sources. So with those, again, I know that's a lot to conceptualize, think about uh, as you listen, and I'll, I'll outline some tools to try to look for this as you go, but just try to remind yourself as we're listening to parts um, that all of those ranges exist within whatever source we're listening to. Um, so for example, I'm going to play back a guitar sound. This is <laughs> My fault. Sorry about that. So if we listen to these guitars here, and again, these are dry, so not processed. Try to take note. They have a little bit of a, of like a, We'll call it a, a woofiness in the low range. Like you can just feel that, that kind of air moving. You don't necessarily hear it. You feel it more than you hear it. Uh, the fundamental frequencies within that are in your two to 400 hertz range. Uh, that's the actual notes that you're hearing. Right? So try to just start like situating that in your mind. Like if you're imagining the scale of it, like this on a graph, then that, uh, that crackly sort of sound that you're hearing that amp distortion. That kind of exists above the fundamental. That's where you're talking about your, your 3000, 4000 Hertz kind of range. And then it's hard to hear, but if you listen carefully, you can hear above that, there's kind of like this airiness kind of, again, this is a situation where you kind of feel it more than you hear it, but like above the crackly distortion, listen for the, uh, for that air. Uh, 
All right. So with that established, I'm going to start working through the actual parameters of an equalizer and how you can use them and how they actually affect the sound. So we can use uh, this guitar for our example right now. Um, worth noting, and this is an often made mistake, EQs are helpful for taking a sound source that has unpleasant qualities and mitigating those qualities. Like if there's a frequency range that's unpleasant in the tone of that particular sound, you can bring that down and then f maybe find a place in the frequency range that that instrument has a more pleasant tone and bring that up. Um, that is to say, improving the overall quality of that sound source as an individual. Um, and that is a valid use of an equalizer, but the more important use is strategically planning what you're going to leave in a source and what you're going to remove such that there is space for every one of the sources to exist between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. So with that, here's our guitar. <laughs> Okay, so first of all, remember we identified that kind of low air, boomy, woofiness. Uh, I don't think that I want my guitar to contribute that to the overall mix. I want to leave that space for my bass and my kick. And even though it's not particularly loud in this guitar, if we leave it in, that's still information that's going to be taking up space that could be occupied by other low end instruments. So first thing that we're going to apply is what's called a filter. Specifically, in this case, we're going to use a high pass filter. What a filter does is it allows you to set a frequency point uh, beyond which the frequencies either below or above that, depending on what kind of filter you're using, are attenuated, are cut by a certain slope, uh, eventually being reduced to nothing. So uh, I'll just over-exaggerate this a little bit. You can see on this graph, this is what's called a high pass filter, meaning the filter passes anything higher than the frequency. So right now it's set at 112 hertz, anything from 112 hertz up is not affected by the filter. Everything below 112 hertz is reduced, in this case by six decibels per octave, which is to say by the time this frequency, if we follow the line down, by the time it reaches 56 hertz, it is six decibels quieter than 112 hertz. And then when you reduce that by half again, it's 12 dB quieter, and we can make this like 12 dB, so twice as steep, three times as steep. So in the case of this guitar, here's nothing. And I'm going to gradually apply the high pass so you can hear the effect of it. So you hear how if we turn it all the way up, it kind of sounds like it's coming out of a tin can because there's no low frequency content within it. There's nothing, even at its lowest, there's nothing below 500 hertz in this. Uh, so obviously we don't want to be that aggressive with it, but we do want to take some of this low end away. Like, we know that we don't want the guitar to contribute very much in the low end. So, uh, for me, 
listening to that woofiness, I think safely we could cut up to 200 hertz and get the tone we want out of the guitar, but leave plenty of room in the low register for our kick and our bass. So I'm gonna turn this off and I'll turn it on in the middle of playback so you can hear what it's doing. So you hear it thins it out a little bit, uh, but this is where that, that argument of improving individual sound versus setting contribution to the overall sound uh, comes into play. Is this versus this a more pleasing sound on its own? Yeah, probably. If that if this guitar was the only sound source in this song, I wouldn't put this high pass filter on it because it sounds better without it. But I know that this guitar isn't the only sound source in this song, and therefore I'm going to make the choice to alter its tone on its own with the expectation that it will create space for other instruments around it um, and making sure that I'll be able to make the guitar present relative to the other instruments in other ways. So I'm going to leave that on. Uh, now, just as there is a high pass filter, there is also a low pass filter, which is to say anything lower than the filter is passed and anything higher than the filter is cut. Uh, works the same way, just backwards. Has the same controls. Uh, remember we talked about that, that airiness at the top? That's some space that I'm going to want to be occupied by my cymbals and my lead vocal and my background vocals and effects. Uh, I don't need the guitar up there. So again, I'll over exaggerate the effect of this. So you hear how it sounds muffled and kind of far away. Um, the high frequencies are responsible for what we call presence, which is to say like, your perceived closeness to a sound. So if there's less high frequency content, you're going to perceive a sound as being further away. And likewise, if there's more high frequency content, you're going to perceive that as being closer. So again, we don't want this to be this drastic, but we can probably cut anything above say 12,000 Hertz. And I'll AB this. <laughs> And again, that's a subtle change, but it is an alteration. And some may argue that I've made the guitar worse, but again, we have to always be thinking globally about, okay, cutting this in the guitar is going to allow me to boost that in something else, something else that needs it more, something else that I want more to contribute that range to my sum than anything else. So filters are your most basic function of an EQ. Uh, typically that's like the first step I always do is I set my high and my low pass. Uh, next is your shelving EQ. Now the way a shelf works is it's similar to a filter, except you also have gain control. So I've got my low filter here set at 500 Hertz. And if I work this gain up, you can see in the red here that everything below 500 hertz is being boosted by 10 dB, or I could cut it. So it's everything in a low shelf, everything below the frequency is affected by the gain that you set. And with a high shelf, same deal, everything above the frequency is affected by the gain that you set. So in this guitar, we now need to be thinking, okay, we've effectively with our filters set the upper and lower boundaries of 
the frequency space that this instrument can occupy. Now, as the frequency on either end of the spectrum approaches that boundary, how do we want it to behave? How do we want it to be affected as it moves to the extremes? Well, in the case of the low end, which we'll address first, now I can hear how this guitar might have the propensity to get thin sounding. Um, it's kind of getting there already, and our high pass certainly took it in that direction. Uh, that may be okay in the sum, and we'll, we would have to check, but just for the sake of argument, I'm going to say that I want to give myself a little bit more body back to that sound. So I know I've set my lower boundary at 200, but maybe say at 350 hertz, so a little bit more in that fundamental range, I'm going to boost up from there down to my high pass. Um, and we're just going to do that gradually, and I'll kind of narrate it as we go. Now, if I were to exaggerate this, so that's not very good. But if we got rid of all of it, now it sounds like it's coming out of a, a portable radio. So that's not what we want either. So for me, I think I just want to warm it up a little bit, thicken it a little bit. Uh, so we're going to do this. Maybe not even that much. So I've only boosted this by one decibel. Um, it's a subtle change, but subtle changes add up to a lot over the course of a whole mix. Um, I'm not doing anything crazy to this, uh, but it's going to keep a little bit more of that warmth, a little bit more of that thickness in this sound source relative to the other parts, um, which in, I'm going to go ahead and make the assertion that that's a desirable effect here. Uh, now with the upper register, if we were to move this down here. So remember how I said that amp distortion is in that three to 4,000 hertz range. There's that crackliness, which isn't very nice, but if we got rid of it, then the guitar sounds really not good. So in my opinion, I don't think this guitar needs to contribute uh, very much as it approaches its top boundary either. Um, especially with how distorted it is. Um, so I'm going to take maybe, let's say from 4,000 hertz, and I'm going to cut that down a little bit. Again, that's a very subtle change, but that will give me two decibels more room in the top end to give to some other source like a vocal or cymbals or a solo, something that needs to be more present than this rhythm guitar. So just to show you what we've done so far, I'm going to bypass this. This is our original sound. That's our manipulation of it. Okay. Uh, again, you could argue that the guitar individually sounds worse, but we're being strategic in thinking about how this guitar is going to stack up with the rest of the parts. Um, so we've set our, sh our filters, we've set our shelves. Now we have our parametric bands to address. Um, typically I try to, and this is just uh, for sake of using different plugins, I, I typically will tend to limit myself to using only two parametric bands in addition to my filters and my shelves. Um, if you need more 
uh, okay, just it's harder. It's hard to justify anything in excess of six total bands of a parametric EQ. Uh, at that point, you need to start asking your yourself questions about how the part was recorded or was performed. Um, but that's kind of a, a tangent. So these two bands that I'm going to use here, we have all three controls. We have gain, frequency, and width totally at our, at our control. So with these, we're going to be listening for specific tendencies in the mid range. So like I said, with our filters, we set our lower and upper boundaries and with our shelves, we set the behavior of the frequency as it approaches those extreme boundaries. But there's still all this space in the middle that we haven't messed with. And there is a lot of frequency content in that range from every sound source. So here is where we need to start doing what we're, what, what is called carving, uh, really being judicious about specifically narrower frequency ranges uh, that will leave specific spaces for other things. For example, uh, this is only one of the guitar parts. There is a second. Just to give you a sense of you know how this will grow. So I might say that in order to keep the parts distinct, I might, uh, I might find a, a frequency range of each part to boost and then cut the other part by the same amount in that same range so that they each have their own space. So one way that you could do that, ideally you'll get to the point that you can do that just by listening uh, because you'll have trained your ears to hear the full frequency spectrum of overtones that are present in any sound source. But one way to get, uh, to learn that and, uh, figure it out, uh, starting out is to use a meter. So I am going to call up a meter on both of these channels. So that's for my, we'll call that guitar one. And we'll call this guitar two. And we'll play it back. All right, so if we look at these waves, we can see that there's this kind of like dull, but like dull and wide boost here on guitar two between 350 and 700 we'll call it now if we look at that same range over here on guitar one it's a little bit more textured um, so that leads me to think that that might be you know something worth contributing more from this guitar part than the other so I might say that I'm going to add 700 hertz to guitar one, and I'm going to, but before I do that, I'm going to cut 700 hertz from guitar two. So, just to give you a sense, uh, I'm going to take one of my bands, I'm going to put it at 700 hertz, and I'm going to listen. And you can hear how the parts are kind of stepping on each other. They're doing what's called masking. Um, they're covering each other up. And that's not what you want. You want both of them to exist in harmony. So this is how we achieve that. I've decided that I'm going to keep 700 hertz contributed from guitar one. And to give that a little bit more breathing room, I'm going to take that frequency range out of guitar two. So this is where... Uh, you're getting into actual mixing in that we're going to be EQing one part but listening to two parts 
and ideally we'd have the whole mix in but for the sake of the uh demonstration i'm going to keep it to just these two but i'm going to be affecting one and listening how that affects the total of both parts so i'm going to slowly start bringing 700 700 hertz down <laughs> So you see if I go extreme with it, I'm only hearing guitar one because I've taken most of the mid-range out of guitar two. So we don't want to do that. But what we do want to do is start adding some of this back only as far as we need to. So we're kind of listening for the point at which guitar one and guitar two balance each other. Maybe, maybe something like that. So now we can hear guitar one and guitar two. Um, and they both sound distinct and intelligible with each other. Uh, but we probably don't need to affect all of these frequencies around. Remember, our center frequency is 700. But if you look at this graph, this is affecting up to almost 2,000 and as far down as almost 200. So we're gonna use our Q range to tighten that up a little bit. So again, we'll do that with listening. So if we go too narrow, that gets rid of everything that we've done. Uh, that masking issue is bad. So we're gonna slowly start widening this out as far as we need. something like that so to give you a sense of what that has done that's with it see how that's just like it just sits better like it just feels better on your ears um but likewise um we can go back to our uh, our our graphs and see if there's anything that we'd like to bring back up in guitar two that guitar one might be stepping on. So we look and we see that there's a little bit of a anemic spot between like 1200 and 2200 in guitar two. And that range is pretty full across the board in guitar one. So maybe um, what I would do first is cut in guitar one, but for the sake of our example, continuing to modify guitar two, I'm just gonna go straight to boosting. Um, there's a school of thought with EQ that states that you should only ever cut, you should never boost because you're trying to make room for things. You're not trying to make things take up more room. So if you want to hear, you know, more high end out of the vocal, you need to take high end out of everything else. That, uh, as far as my opinion on that, it's true to a certain point, but it's, you know, if a frequency is deficient somewhere, it's not going to be less deficient if you take that frequency out of everything else. Um, so... I guess, I guess uh, the best rule of thumb I can give is it's okay to use an EQ to boost, but every time you think you need to boost, double check yourself and really ask yourself why you're doing it. Um, and if you have an answer to that, great, then continue. And if you don't, maybe hold off, maybe come back to it if it's still bugging you. But uh, for the sake of this example, I'm going to go ahead and boost kind of the middle of that range we identified remember 1200 to 2200 so the center of that would be 1700 and i'm going to start boosting that up in comparison to guitar one so you see if we get if we get extreme with it guitar two eclipses guitar one which is not what we want but if we're a little bit more conservative with it, so 
So maybe something like that. And then we can dial in our Q range. Yeah, something like that. In general, your boosts are going to have wider Q ranges than your cuts. Um, it just sounds more natural to the ear. Um, so to AB, what we've done here, that's on, that's off. So you see, it just brings a little bit more clarity, a little bit more life to guitar two, uh, making it more co-equal with the already pretty bright, lively guitar one. So if we were to take this entire thing off just by itself, Here's what that sounds like. So that's the original dry signal. And then with our EQ curve applied. So you can see how six subtle changes on their own can really make a difference. And again, you might think that that sounds worse with the EQ on than off, but if we listen to it relative to another guitar, and if I take the EQ off, see how that's just kind of like muddy, non-distinct. You've just kind of got this big guitar soup. Compared to if we apply our curve, You see how you can hear both parts in equal measure with equal clarity. Um, so yeah, those are just some, those are the things you need to be thinking about, uh, the sort of questions you need to be asking yourself as you're approaching applying EQ to your mix. Uh, in general, this should be the first step to every mix after you've, of course, edited as we talked about last week. Um, before you get into any uh, dynamics processing or things that we'll talk about later in this uh, in this series. Also, uh, just in case you're wondering, there are uh, topics built into the rest of this series that address specific instruments uh, where we'll be talking about, you know, best practices in EQ for drums and bass versus best practices in EQ for guitars or keyboards or vocals. Uh, we'll get more into the specifics um, as far as how EQ can be used for each part, like each specific part. Uh, but in the meantime, just to sort of illustrate the point uh, about the importance of EQ across an entire mix. Uh, I've got all of my equalization processing uh, on the second insert strip here. And I'm gonna play back the whole mix, uh, minus the vocal again, um, just so you can hear the total mix and then I'll turn all the EQs off so you can hear the difference that they make as they're summed and applied together. So here's the whole mix, dry, no EQs. Let me jump to a different part of the song here. And then if I apply the EQs, see here how that, it just gets that much more pleasant, that much more intelligible, clear, easy to listen to. Uh, like, I don't know, for me, like when the EQs come on across the whole mix, it's like my ears like kind of breathe a sigh of relief almost 
because like listening without it it's it's tiring it would get uh grating after a while um because your ears are trying to discern all this information at all the frequency points and that's not what your brain wants to do when you're listening to music your brain just wants to enjoy the sound and the lyrics and the full experience that you don't want to be trying to discern parts so again just to illustrate that effect here it is eq each drum all the cymbals the bass both guitars nothing stepping on each other and then if i take that away you hear how it's kind of like just a mess of guitars kind of symbols in the background and the bass is just sort of struggling to get its head above water. And then EQs come on and everything is equal. And the best part is if we check our master meter, if we look at our, uh, our total here, I'm going to turn my mic off because it will contribute to it, but uh, I'm going to play the mix back and you'll see that because the EQs, the EQs have been applied strategically, this is going to chart as a generally flat line across the whole frequency spectrum. So as you can see, <laughs> ignoring my voice, this graph in general trends as a flat line. Uh, if you were to take my sibilance out of it, <laughs> uh, right here where it starts dropping off, that's it, 31 hertz. So that, and then the next bar line is 16 hertz. So that's sub audible information. Um, it does start dropping off a little bit in the top end. So that's something that I might want to address either in my low pass filtration. I could maybe add some more of that information back across the mix, or I could choose to um, add some of that information back uh, on my master bus, which is another episode down the road in and of itself. Uh, but yeah, with that, I think you guys should be pretty well in hand started thinking about uh, EQing strategically and effectively. In the meantime, try to start uh, quizzing yourself. If you want to call this homework, that's fine. Try to start hearing the harmonic series, like all the overtones that are contained within sounds. Uh, just, you know, like listen and try to really focus and hear like, okay, you're hearing like the primary sound, but then also picking up like the high ringing sound that, you know, may be present with it or any sort of like lower rumbly woofy kind of sounds uh, that would be present in just both in everyday sounds and the music that you're listening to. Um, as you're listening to songs, also think about, you know, think about the individual parts and ask yourself, okay, what frequency range is that part contributing to? Um, and what frequency ranges is that part not contributing to? Um, if you really want to get into it, there are also uh, ear training apps that will play a tone back at you and you have like frequency flashcards kind of uh, where the app will play a tone and you have to identify like the frequency that it played back to you. Uh, so if you really want to get crazy, get one of those. There's plenty of free ones. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, that is my my parting request to you all that you go off for this next week and think about those those things as you're listening uh next week we'll be talking about 
the uh, the cousin and the uh, the frequent partner to EQ, which is compression. Uh, and we'll also be talking about gating. So next week we'll be all about dynamic processing, which is an equally big topic, equally important. Uh, and I'll see you then. <laughs>